Hello, everybody. Uh, Peter Regan, Senior Director of Contingent Workforce Strategies and Research here, uh, based in London. Welcome to today's webinar, where I'm joined by one of the co-founders of Worksome and uh, also a very special person from Accenture. So let's get cracking. Um, so Riley has gone through a little bit of the, uh, the housekeeping. Do uh, keep your questions coming. We'd like to make this interactive. We'll get back to as many questions during the webinar as we can using that Q&A uh, function. Any that we don't get back to, we'll come back to you uh, after uh, the event. Uh, just in case you don't know, uh, Staffing Industry Analysts, the uh, global research and advisory organization, um, putting out around about 240 research items every year, putting on events. We'll be in London at our CWS Summit at the Royal Lancaster Hotel in May. Lots of editorial items out there for you to, uh, to digest. And if you're interested in going back to school, then our CCWP certification training is there for you. Um, I'm very fortunate in as much as I spend a lot of my time speaking to our council members around the world. I've been to Australia, uh, Singapore already today. Uh, I'll be in America later on uh, this evening. Hopefully some of that experience uh, comes out today, but thank you to all of our uh, council members. I'll introduce this panel to you uh, formally in a, in a few moments, but I'm delighted to be joined by Matthias uh, Lemon uh, from Worksome and also Shannon Swift, Senior Procurement Manager at Accenture. Just testing the audio, both of you. Are you out there? Indeed. Hello. All right. Okay. Yes. We'll come to you in a moment then. What I'm going to do is just try to uh, paint the scene. Yeah. Um, are we going to have a prolonged economic downturn? Well, the future's never happened. The future never will happen. But there are certain indicators where you out there, whether you're listening to this live or recorded, you'll have to make your own uh, decision. The outlook is, I would say, is going to be a bit uh, recessionary. Uh, this report here, this is what the World Economic Forum uh, put together. And these are the risks that over 1,000 global leaders say have worsened since the COVID crisis. You see that they're split out across social, technological, technological, economic and environmental issues. I don't want to get you down too much by reading through them all, but clearly there are a lot of things in the world that are getting worse. Uh, if we look out to 2023, we kind of see 2023 as being a year of two halves. Uh, the first half is probably a little bit sticky, uh, with the second half of the year maybe getting a little bit better. Um, this data that you see here, which is GDP growth uh, across some of the European major markets, is what we use to base our staffing estimates on. Um, the World Bank estimates that the world economy is going to be growing at its third weakest rate in three decades. Uh, clearly, you know, driven by the pandemic, the global financial crisis, uh, the war in Ukraine. And if we do dip into a recession, it will be the first time in over 80 years that we would have experienced uh, a recession a second recession in the same decade. Um, but the World Bank does expect deep um, downturns in most of the advanced economies around the world. You're talking about uh, the US being a very mediocre 0.5 percent and, and Europe uh, overall uh, sort of flatlining in term of, terms of uh, growth. Um, these are our uh, staffing forecasts for European staffing markets, the major staffing markets. You can see in 2023, then forecasting an average 2.55% uh, uh, growth. Um, overall, Europe, we'll come on to it later on, is probably forecasted around about 3%. And you might say, well, OK, that's kind of OK. But if you take in inflation, the rising prices of, of work, then it may indicate that the underlying demand is, is flat, if not going uh, backwards. Um, global unemployment, um, 
in developed countries in particular uh, was trending down quite significantly uh, prior to, to COVID. Uh, Europe, apart from Italy, uh, is at an all-time um, low in terms of unemployment. It's doing very well. But the big issue, is it going to continue? And that's going to be part of uh, our conversation today, is that what do we do during a potential long-term economic downturn? But there is some bright news as well. We're, we're seeing the growth in platforms. If we think here, we're talking here about temporary staffing platforms, uh, you know, what were marginal uh, offerings and now become mainstream. If you look at on the left hand side, the growth in traditional staffing, non-platform staffing growing at 2.3%, whereas obviously from a lower base, uh, platform staffing increasing in 2022 by 75%. It was even more than that uh, the year before, um, with a huge drive for, for, for healthcare in particular. Um, looking at staffing, and I, I thank my wonderful colleague, John Nerven, for this analogy. Um, the world is often worried that technology, robots, is going to overtake the world and reduce jobs. Now, Technology throughout time has already always created a bigger pie, a bigger economy. Um, we actually see here on the left hand side, um, automated car washes down 50 percent. What a stat, eh? Uh, yet we see hand car washes going up 50 percent. I think this is a good analogy for staffing, potentially the future with regards to manual working uh, could actually be quite good. We're also going to see maybe hybrid solutions. So technology is not going to overtake the world. Technology and human beings are going to work together. If we take the staffing analogy just a little bit further, uh, then maybe you know, you're know you going to end up cleaning your own cars using your family. Uh, we're not in one moment uh, condoning child labor here, by the way, uh, but do pay these people good pocket money if there are your own children. This is direct sourcing uh, in a way. Um, just to give you a little bit more background, maybe uh, from a global perspective in terms of where the markets are, this diagram here is the major markets that have over $5 billion of staffing revenue and Europe accounts for nine of these countries. So whatever's going to happen, this is a European webinar, we'll focus on Europe, then Europe is going to be impacted to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, the diagram on the bottom right here was, you saw that in a previous slide, but if you are interested in looking at staffing revenue forecasts for more of the European countries, then they're in the graphic on the left-hand side, forecasts for 2023, averaging 3% uh, growth, and 2024, 4% growth. But remember what I said, if you couple that with the inflation that's going on, then potentially the underlying demand here is actually going backwards. You can make your own decisions about that. Uh, and the finally, just in terms of putting a global perspective on this, something, this graphic, these circles are all proportional. So this is the size of the major staffing markets. These are 2021 figures, but I would say it's probably not changed a great deal. And one thing that often people uh, are very surprised at is the size of the Japanese market. Uh, so clearly it will give you an idea in terms of where uh, the business is. So um, just before we get into the conversation, I'm going to ask uh, Riley, he's just opened up a poll. You can read this. What are the most important objectives for you in 2023? And we'll come back to the results of this poll and have a conversation about them a bit later on. So please do uh, respond to that wherever you are. Obviously, if you're watching the recording, you can't. Um, so I'm going to hand over the uh, the baton now to uh, Matthias and welcome Matthias. You can introduce yourself and uh, and Shannon Swift. Thank you very much, Shannon. Do you want to do you want to start? Yes, sounds great. Thanks, Matthias. Thanks, Peter. Um, so nice to meet you all. My name is Shannon Swift. I work within uh, Accenture in the procurement team, um, and my main focus is our external talent strategy across Europe. Matthias, back to you. 
Thank you. My name is Matthias Lindemann. I'm a co-founder of a company called Worksum, and Worksum is an external uh, workforce management platform. So we are one of the newer technologies arising in this space, and what we do is that we combine um, talent pooling and direct sourcing with um, compliance, worker classification, indemnification, insurance, um, as well as uh, supplier management and payroll. So it's like an all-in-one end-to-end platform to manage external workforces. Uh, and thanks a lot for joining today. I guess the reason you're here is to learn a bit about um, strategies for innovating in contingent workforce programs during uh, potentially harder times that we have ahead. So uh, let me take over the presentation if I can. Can I do that? You should have it. There we go. Um, and basically um, jump straight back to uh, some of the things that Peter talked about, which is essentially that the outlook for the economy globally doesn't look as good as it has. So um, this is just the reality. I guess most of us feel it in some way, whether that's an inflation, uh, insecurity around um, the future outlook in terms of um, uh, spend, uh, company strategies in terms of cost savings and efficiency and so on. And today, um, what we're going to cover is um, topics that relate to this in terms of how to innovate contingent workforce programs. So we're going to touch on things like cost savings, efficiency, technology, compliance and regulate regulatory environments uh, globally, and basically trying to wrap up uh, in a conversation around what does this mean for um, contingent workforce program leaders, and how can you take um, this current state of the world and turn it into a competitive advantage when it comes to tapping into the flexible workforce? And how can you use technology and new opportunities to not necessarily kind of completely disrupt and radically innovate your uh, setup, um, but also enhance what already works with some of these new opportunities that are occurring. So please um, do ask questions in the Q&A. We will all follow um, uh, that as we go on. So if you have any questions relating to a slide and so on, don't hesitate to jump in and ask the question. All right, let's kick it off. Um, so basically, the global economy is slowing down. However, the war for talent is still going on. Um, and especially when it comes to tech, tech talent, we do see that uh, right now there is a global shortage of 2 million tech workers. Um, that will increase to 4 million in 2030. And what that means is that almost no matter how the world economy is turning, there is such a big uh, gap between supply and demand when it comes to some of these um, uh, skills, highly skilled labor, especially in technology. And what that means is that the contingent workforce and being able to uh, stay agile and tap into this workforce will become a massive competitive driver for almost any company that relies on technology going forward. So despite an economic potential downturn, the war for talent is definitely still going on. Um, so what that means is, of course, you know, build a um, competitive contingent workforce program, uh, which a lot of companies are luckily doing. So we do see that um, companies have for many years now kind of ramped up their ability to work with external workers. Um, and we have seen an acceleration uh, in that based on COVID, hybrid work, remote work, etc. Um, but actually also because of the potential economic downturn, where we see a lot of companies um, tapping into uh, and replacing also uh, people that they have laid off with flexible workers or contingent talent. Um, so here's some numbers um, pointing towards that. And I think especially um, the one in the bottom is worth highlighting, and I guess you've seen that numerous times, um, but the freelance workforce, the, the you know, amount of people who choose that way of living is growing tremendously. So, so 90 million people in the US um, by 2028. In Europe, um, we see the same trend, albeit a little bit um, smaller numbers um, because of the general economy and, and workforce regulations, um, but it's definitely on still, right? So just learn to tap into the contingent workforce and you will stay competitive and be able to access the best talent um, and it's all good. It's not that simple, I'm afraid, um, because what's very clear is that tapping into an external 
contingent workforce does come with enormous friction for companies. And this friction does increase right now because of various factors, which we will talk about during, during the rest of the webinar. Um, but some interesting facts is that the majority of companies globally have no idea what's going on with their contingent workforce. So their HR departments are typically, typically looking at perms, and no one has any clue how many people are not perms but working for their company. They don't have a central overview of compliance. They don't know how much money they spend. They don't have a strategy for when to go um, outside the company to hire and when to use internal people and so on. So I, I suspect that this is not the case for you um, joining this webinar because you will generally have a continued workforce program and therefore I uh, would expect that you have some sort of uh, data on this. Um, we also see that the average time to onboard a continued worker is long. It's 22 days. And what that means is that for a lot of the skills that companies are looking for now and uh, for a lot of the work that they are going to come in and do, um, it's simply too long. And I'll get back to this a bit later. But uh, speed is a massive driver behind success in continuing workforce programs. And this is a, generally a symptom of too much friction in the whole kind of stack and setup between technology and services and um, also impacted by the global nature of a lot of hiring now. Um, then we see efficiency as a major uh, topic as well. And we see um, cost control as a massive one as well um, on the rise right now. And Shannon, I, I know you've got some, uh, some, some comments on these topics. What's, uh, what's top of your mind when we talk about this? Um, so naturally, I'm in procurement. So cost control is where my eyes have gone to. Um, one thing that's really, really important as part of your contingent workforce program, especially in an economic downturn, is going to be that cost control. That's the number one thing on everyone's lips. The really impactful and the most impactful thing I've done as part of cost control is that total uh, cost of ownership analysis, where we compare different types of workers. And some of the, what I've seen has been really, really interesting. So when we look in Europe, there's some countries where we see that's actually quite similar when we compare it to FDEs such as Spain or Italy, and therefore growing a contingent workforce program is, is an easier conversation with the business and with leadership. Mm. However, there are other, other countries like Matthias, the Nordics, where it isn't quite the same. We find a big disparity and therefore sometimes our program, the cost difference can really impact our growth of the, of the program in itself. And actually, I'll jump just jump in and reveal uh, from the poll that um, driving cost savings is the number one topic for uh, the participants today. So that's definitely relevant. Yeah. Perfect. So just to quickly add on that one then, is it's important not uh, there's not a one size fits all approach because each country, there'll be different impacts on cost. Therefore, as part of that review, although a total cost of ownership analysis, trust me, is very difficult. <laughs> Um, and very, very hard to get the data, but once you do some of the conversations, it can really transform uh, with leadership and with HR. Hmm. Shannon, can I just, when you talk about total cost of ownership, what, what are you, what's going into that total cost? That's a million dollar question, Peter. It's um, our front, upfront costs. Well, it's, it's, I could be here for days, uh, but it, what, normally what we're trying to do is look at the, the cost of both. We get overheads, we get upfront costs, we get, let's say, if we have to make redundancy costs, and then what we do is we feed that into a bit of a financial model. And using that financial model, which is far cleverer than me, it will then spit out some, some important inf information, which will then give us a, an indication. We will never, ever get apples with apples, but we try and get apples with pears to give us that indication. So it's not perfect. I've never, I, but if someone's got it out there, I'll be really, really interested to hear. But that's roughly how I do it. We do have a question um, saying when measuring onboarding, I think it relates to the 22.7 days here. Yeah. Uh, does, the clock, does the clock start ticking upon offer acceptance? And, and um, just a comment on that. It starts when um, the person that the company wants to hire has been identified. Um, and sometimes there's actually a pretty big lag between that point in time and when um, the offer is accepted because part of that friction is in issuing the contract, making sure that the right paperwork is signed, NDAs, etc. Um, and that um, it is the right contract based on work classifications and stuff like that. So it's basically from the person has been identified until the work can begin. Yeah. Um, 
there's uh, numerous questions uh, popping in. There's also one asking 22 days to onboard. Is that from uh, distribution to start day? Okay, I think I, I just uh, answered that. So anyway, for many companies, it's too long. I'll move on now um, to just speak about some more, um, I guess, high level um, dangers, we can call them, not to, to throw too much uh, water on the fire here, but um, essentially what is very clearly going on um, globally is that compliance is on the rise. The reason, the root cause for that is because when the um, flexible workforce, the freelance economy, gig economy, all these um, parts of the workforce combined, when that is growing, it is incredibly important for governments to have control over how these people are taxed and how this work is taxed, because if they don't, they lose out on massive um, tax revenues. So that is the root cause for um, that we see legislation such as I-35. We see um, a massive um, influx of new regulation in the US. Um, we see uh, DAC 7 in the EU basically trying to kind of take control more over uh, this part of the workforce. Um, and we do see an increase in audits from the IRS and the HMRC um, because they really want to have control over this. So that's something to really, really keep in mind when innovating um, the programs that uh, that's, that's here to stay and actually increase. Um, then we also see that lots of companies struggle with legacy technology. So this um, little graph, the only real thing to note here is basically that the lines, the chart go down. What that it means is that um, generally companies are not really satisfied with their technology that they have to manage contingent workforces. So these are MSPs and, and, and BMSs. Um, and I think it's well known in the industry that there is a lot of scrutiny around like what does the best technology stack look like today and how do you build one that is geared towards um, being you know in efficient in in the future from here um, and then we see legacy processes based on these two other things because when all the complexity arises on this um, you'll have to build processes around that to manage and that results in um, slowness and uh, increased cost and, and rigid operations um, Shannon, what's your what's your comments on on, on all of these seen from um, the real world? So, from a Europe perspective, I probably am naturally biased because I'm sat in Europe. But I think compliance is particularly tricky, um, more so in Europe than other markets. Um, the reason I say that is because it just feels like constant change, and I'm sure everyone on this call is feeling the exact same. Um, even now, I'm seeing in Spain, they're going in one direction where they are focusing on making it more difficult to hire contingent workers, where Italy are going the opposite direction. So even within one market, which is Europe, there are people doing different Italy things. Italy can't make it any more difficult, can they? <laughs> <laughs> I know. And then obviously IR35, they were scrapping IR35, and then they scrapped the scrap. Um, so it's just constant change. So it's about making sure that your contingent workforce program is agile i think that's the buzzword that i'm probably going to say today a lot is because otherwise it's if it's inflexible it's going to take a lot of work every time there's change for teams to adapt and really understand what what impact it is going to make mm. um and then on tech i would say is that it's a really tricky tricky balance to make because on one side you've got the business users they want an amazon-like experience we've got suppliers that we want to come and work with us We've got also talent who we want to work with. And we want everyone to have a really easy process, but me in procurement or those of you in HR, our focus is on data. We want as much data as possible. So it's tr tricky trying to find that balance. And that's probably the biggest challenge that, that I see with, with, with the legacy tech. Mm. I, I really like these three pillars, if I could just come in a second, because if, 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 we, if we are going into an economic downturn, if that happens, then typically speaking, there's going to be an awful lot of work of offloading people and whatever at the outset, but then it's potentially going to be quiet. And the idea is, is to make sure that you come out of that downturn in a better position than what you went in. So I don't think there's any time like now is when you should be thinking, how would we look at these things if we had more time on our hand to look at our compliance legacy tech uh, and processes to come out the other side. So this is all about preparing. And then if we don't hit that economic downturn, you're still got a roadmap to address these things. But absolutely, in an economic downturn, look at these things to come out better the other side when you need to start ramping up more efficiently. Yeah. 
Totally agree. And I think uh, just to, to turn back to compliance, that's going to be a massive driver behind innovation here because that is generally one of the biggest blockers to working efficiently with um, with contingent workers. With, this is just a very recent piece of news um, where it turns out that Deal has um, classified a ton of their own people as independent contractors, including the CEO. And what this generally means is that there will just be more eyes on how companies deal with and classify and tax and pay their um, contingent workforce for sure. Um, and what we also see is that, um, so we work with companies in all kinds of industries and um, typically very large companies that have global operations. And um, we hear so many stories about how companies cope with this. Um, so uh, here are some examples, companies putting everyone on payroll to make sure that they are compliant. Companies only hiring SOWs to stay outside of IR35. Um, companies that don't engage um, self-employed sole traders at all. Um, companies that uh, do know that they miss out on the majority of the attractive talent in the um, contingent workforce, but they have to stick to um, classifying everybody as W2s or inside IR35 because their tax and legal teams uh, force them to, et cetera, et cetera. And what these are symptoms of, in, in my perspective, is um, outdated and, and pretty inefficient um, ways of managing contingent workers, because it should be possible to, um, to a larger degree, kind of open the floodgates and let uh, the business hire whoever they want and um, make sure that it is done in a compliant way. Um, Shannon, I know you've, you've got some war stories about uh, some of these as well. Yeah, so look, we, we all know that there is risk in our contingent workforce programs, so many of these don't really come as too much of a surprise to me. So on one hand, tax and legal, they can be our absolute best friends when we want them to be, but there are some days where they can make our job really difficult. So one thing that's really helped the program that I've ran is being close, building relationships, because then I try and see, I, I get a little bit more flexibility, because our aim is to find talent quickly, that's cost competitive rate and that's high quality and some of the things that they put in place the barriers make that far far more difficult so mm. working with them early and when there is change in compliance working with them quickly and making sure you build something that's a little bit more flexible because sometimes if it was up to them we wouldn't be able to find talent externally at all yeah. so that's just one tip from from what i've seen yeah i agree there's a question saying uh, what is the recommended engagement model for ic's for independent contractors is it time and material uh, or is it a fixed fee uh, slash statement of work um to give my answer i think that the right engagement model is whatever is right for the project if you uh, kind of kind of have hard limits and saying we can only hire people on sows it will mean that you cannot access uh, the right talent in my perspective because some of these people will say this the scope of the work doesn't fit a fixed deliverable at a fixed price. It's much more iterative. I need to be part of the team. I need to work with the team. And I'm not sure exactly uh, how to give a fixed price in in advance for this. Um, so I think it's definitely important to be uh, flexible and, and allow to hire ICs on both types of contracts. And, and it's also important to think that uh, the definition of an IC may well vary from one country to another. So if we're thinking of compliance, I mean, typically, you know, are they under your supervision and control? No, they shouldn't be. Are you their only uh, client? No, you shouldn't be. Are they doing work that's core to your business? No, they shouldn't be. Uh, but most countries will have a definition of IC. Um, but I kind of agree with what you're saying then, Matthias, for sure. But make sure the definition is correct. And I think also um, a lot of companies are in a situation where the um, contractors that they hire are doing work that is very core to their business. Yeah. They are sometimes the CEO hired in for uh, six months to uh, manage the turnaround or two years or whatever. Um, the board of directors are very often contractors, etc. So it's it's very, very blurry how you define uh, who's in a perm and who's external. Um, and it's super, super important to be agile, as, as you mentioned, Shannon, so you can allow your company to basically focus on finding the best and most relevant people uh, to work with and then make sure they they are hired and paid compliantly and again coming back to the, you know what to do in the downturn you mentioned ir35 there and, and other legislations like that around the world if your company is averse to ic's 
in that downturn, then that's an opportunity to start looking at this. And again, as I say, when you come out the other side, you may be in a better position to embrace this talent because we at SIA believe there's a huge future in ICs. And mm-hmm. if you don't embrace them, you're potentially going to be missing out on some significant talent. Yeah. There's a follow-up question asking, how about uh, HR risks to engage ICs under vague SOW or time and material? And and can I get back to that? Because we're going to touch specifically on risk uh, again. Um, another symptom, uh, I think, of uh, of programs being ripe for innovation is it, if the technology slash the service and experience is very disjointed. Um, imagine if you have... Um, when someone is hiring a contractor, if they really do have to go through numerous systems to manage posting requisitions, getting approval, um, doing the contract NDOs, raising POs, um, managing timesheets and payments and stuff like that. If that's all kind of really, really disjointed, then that is uh, definitely something that um, you should look at and optimize and try to bundle together in, in fewer technologies and platforms and work with integrations, etc. Um, so what are we supposed to do? The economy is going uh, going down. We want to tap into the contingent workforce, but it's so difficult, and the compliance is increasing. And uh, and oh no, but there's got to be a way. And uh, Webex couldn't uh, manage uh, gifts that were alive, but uh, these were a bit more fun when they were moving. Anyway, you get the point where I'm where I'm heading. So uh, for the rest of the webinar, we're going to touch more on like, so what to do about all of that? Like what's the best practices here? What are some of the possibilities with new technology and so on? Um, and here's a list of three things that are going to be massively important. And I think uh, probably part of most continued workforce programs if they are not already. And they are direct sourcing, which um, can be many things, but we'll get back to that. They are IC compliance. Back to your point, Peter, that ICs are on the rise as a, as a group in the workforce, um, as well as strong brand and stellar experience, meaning that it's super important for companies to um, be able to attract um, the best talent here. Um, and Shannon, I know you have also a, a million uh, good uh, points to, to raise on these, but is it okay if I just quickly touch on e- each of these in terms of what's uh, what's what are we really talking about here and why is this important and a good time to um, to look at these things particularly um, in this this economic environment and what I think in terms of direct sourcing is it's essentially if you think of it all companies start with only direct sourcing they only have their brand that they can use to to attract talent and they typically do it directly. Then when companies grow and become often when they become global and um, branched out in numerous business units, etc., they start pushing a lot of that away. And what we're seeing now is a big trend toward taking kind of the power back and not um, pushing as much out to vendors where you don't have the same degree of control. So companies are pushing a, a ton of things out to vendors, but having control over um, the supply chain is, is is becoming massively more important. And the reason why direct sourcing is a good match with, um, with um, getting better economies out of the continued workforce program, and thus something that will be expected, I think, for a lot of programs in a lot of companies, is because it does drive cost savings uh, if done well. Um, and the reason for that is generally that you circumvent an expensive layer in the value chain when sourcing talent, which is often staffing firms, uh, recruiters, etc., that generally charge a markup of anywhere between 10% to 100% on top of the day rate that the contractor um, gets. And if you do that efficiently, it is pretty significant the amount of cost savings you can drive. Um, so that is a major thing. Um, the other thing is that it does often give access to um, faster access to the talent that the business needs if done well. Um, and it's efficient if done well. The challenge is, is that it does require a bit more on the company often because you sit on more of the process yourself. And that brings me over to IC compliance. If you want to source efficiently in this economy and flexibly, meaning that you generally also have um, give the business the ability to source talent from wherever they want, 
then um, more compliance sits on you uh, or you will at least have to control that it is done correctly um, with the value chain. So that is a massive, massive uh, component of doing this right. And again, if you want to do uh, this right and basically reap the benefits of, of you know, being able to source talent flexibly like this, it does require a strong brand and a stellar experience. And if you don't have a strong brand, which there could be many good reasons for, or you just have a, a strategy that is not based on branding as a company, then it does uh, come down to um, scoping projects as interesting towards that talent and making sure that you really give a very good experience um, to these people when they meet your company, when they are onboarded and working and offboarded as well. Shannon, what do you think about um, the things I just said? So I've just got a few other points to add to, the, to this topic in terms of winning uh, during an economic downturn. So my first point is, essentially, you'd hope that an effective contingent workforce program can mitigate the impacts. Considering its business cycle is expected fairly regularly, that we can probably weather through what challenges we see. But I've just got three things that I think are really important. So the first is, when this happens, there is a constant, there's an immediate need to reduce cost and increase flexibility. And first of all, we do turn to our contingent workforce because some of the benefits are that they are flexible. So in the short term, you probably will see a reduction in your contingent workforce, the size of the program at least, um, and that's something to prepare for. I think, but one thing I would say is that when growth does come back, normally it's contingent workers that come back quickest. So normally you don't have as much time as you think you have. But when you do have that time, to Peter's point and to Matthias's point in the middle here, is time to clean the house, time to do housekeeping, review processes, potentially look at audits, look at the external market, what's changing, what are your peers in industry doing, what are, the, are other industry, industries doing even. So now is, the, now is the time when your volumes are down, when you're not running around crazy trying to find talent here, there and everywhere. That's where I would really, really focus because when growth comes back, we all know, that we'll be running around again just trying to really really focus on on that topic and we won't have a chance to look at the things uh, that we really need to and essentially it sets up our program for success and then my kind of final point is around procurement and hr can be very very popular in times of economic downturn um, so it's a real opportunity to show value to show what we can do and deliver for the organization but also it's a ch chance to reset with leadership on what your workforce strategy is. Does, does your workforce strategy need to transform? For example, do you want to set targets on your percentage of FTEs versus your contingent work, workers? It's a good time now when they're starting to feel the pain where they potentially wish they had a more flexible workforce to really drive those conversations and, and, and show the value that you can really add. So they were they're my points to, to raise, Matthias, on, on this particular topic. I totally agree on that. And I think in terms of, uh, of what to do, one, one way of thinking about it um, to drive a competitive advantage if and when the economy picks up, I, I'll say when, um, is to, uh, to really think about this experience because it does matter a lot. And what we see often is that continued workforce programs have been built for, I would say, the middle of, um, of, of what actually goes on. And in the middle, we have um, compliance, legal, procurement, processes, and so on. And out here, we have the talent and the hiring managers. And often, um, you know, there's too little focus on these two endpoints. And companies that focus on these um, are generally kind of going after this bit more of an Uber-like experience. It should be very intuitive how to bring contingent workers into the company. And it should be very intuitive for the um, worker to accept the contract, get paid, um, go through compliance checks and all that. Um, and so what we're seeing essentially, which I think is an interesting point for inspiration for, for a lot of the participants today here, is that we're seeing a new type of contingent workforce program design emerging a um, design where companies don't necessarily have an MSP. If they have one, it's typically a you know, very forward-thinking one. There are some uh, very innovative new MSP models um, emerging, uh, or it's an uh, internal MSP. Um, we see that they typically don't have a traditional VMS because um, these companies are focusing on the people in that value chain less than the vendors. Um, I'll get back to that. 
Um, and the um, companies that go for this type of setup is typically hybrid companies. It's um, companies that are typically in, move, in need of fast moving talent uh, across media, advertising, gaming, software design, etc. So it's, it's typically companies that operate in a very competitive market where um, it's about finding that stellar developer um, and they should typically have been onboarded yesterday. And I think this is pretty interesting because these models are generally built with kind of three things in mind. They are built for speed. That is a massive thing. That is also a reason why often there is no, not necessarily at least a centralized function that sources the talent and so on. They're built for speed by connecting the hiring manager directly to the talent as fast as possible. They're built for minimizing risk. So um, they use technology to do things like work classification, signing NDAs, uh, figuring out what uh, worker set up the worker has so that you can do the right contract and pay them compliantly and tax them in the right way, um, et cetera. Um, and they are uh, very cost efficient because they generally have um, not a lot of layers in that whole supply chain and not a lot of kind of um, patchwork designs in terms of systems and technology and, and all of that. Um, so I think this is pretty interesting. And, and Shannon, you have uh, some experience with, with, with some of these models and parts of uh, Accenture. What's the observation and the benefits and why, why are you working in this way in some places? So I think, I think the biggest growth is in the gig workforce. So I think uh, from what I've seen, I think sometimes we want I don't know, a makeup artist for one hour. How do we manage that? All our tr everything we've done traditionally, everything we've built doesn't support that need. Um, the timelines alone, the 22.7 Mateus that you mentioned earlier, hmm. we, that's not even possible if we need them tomorrow on a, on a site somewhere. So I think that has forced us and, and, and myself, even our mindset to change in terms of everything we always thought we knew. We have to rip it up, throw it in the bin and try something new. And that is part of what my focus is at the moment is what options are out there? How can we do it? How can we go from 22.7 to one day? How is that possible? So I think that that's probably a challenge, and I think that that, that challenge is even going to grow over time. Yeah, I agree. And this is uh, this is what Worksum does: uh, build technology that can basically manage this process end to end. Um, and we do work with lots of companies um, that have this as their technology driving the contingent workforce, but. Um, Companies that have uh, typically much more complex and mature programs running can reap really the same benefits. And, um, you know, it's again about focusing on speed, risk and costs. Um, and it's often driven by a want from the company to really nail direct sourcing, um, build up talent pools, be able to curate the talent between different business units, be able to share the talent between regions, countries, offices, um, departments, etc. Um, and again, to really do that efficiently, um, it's very important to have systems in place um, that can manage the independent contract vetting, compliance, worker classification, etc. Because um, that is going to be a massive uh, driver, I think, um, and a massive cost savings driver as well. Um, and it's also really, really important to limit the, the risk exposure in this because more risk will be sitting on you as the company unless you kind of put it, um, you know, in the supply chain at the right place. And that can be done with the, with technologies such as ours and, and others, but where you basically say, as long as we source talent and contract them and um, engage them via these technology platforms, we know that it is done compliantly, it is indemnified, it is insured, um, so that the, the people managing the talent on the platform, they cannot do wrong. The technology will make sure that it is compliant. Anything to add here, Shannon or Peter? I've certainly got some things to uh, say on direct sourcing. I'm completely uh, with you in terms of some of what you've said on there. It should be take. It should be more the processes on the uh, the end client, but uh, we do see a lot of direct sourcing programs out there that I think are not very direct. They have far too many people still in the chain, but uh, that's another topic, maybe. Yeah. 
And I think I think to your point earlier, Matthias, is direct sourcing is one of many options from mm -hmm. a cost saving perspective. And that will look very different depending on where you are in Europe, because I've mm -hmm. seen in some countries we can implement it in the, the one of the most basic forms. In other countries, we can't. We have to look at different types of direct sourcing models that I perhaps haven't thought about before. Yeah. Um, yeah. So but one thing I'd say is, especially in the lens of an economic downturn is with direct sourcing is working out ways that you can build a business case without high upfront costs because I imagine that'll be a challenge for many of you on the call today will be how do I how do I deploy dark sourcing but with no upfront costs and that I would say is lit working with our supply with, with your supply chain um, because that will be really fundamental in, in making making direct sourcing happen yeah we're still only, it's one of the most talked about things but we're still only seeing about one percent of the contingent workforce coming through direct sourcing channels so it's not the silver bullet yet but will it be personally i think it will be yeah for sure we definitely see that as a massive driver towards cost savings and finding the right talent and so on and and what i think is also important for um companies with more mature programs is that this can be done in a delicate way where you don't necessarily disrupt the existing setup that works well and has for years probably but where it does align and complement um the vms uh, design that you have um, it can be handled by msps we see a lot of msps being very very innovative in terms of trying to tap into direct sourcing and enabling these platforms and um, that further also enable companies to to work with you know freelance marketplaces and boutique uh, recruiters and wherever the talent may be and so on so a lot of things are happening here yeah and on that direct sourcing very briefly we shown you know you work for an organization that's a global brand most people will will recognize that you know we've mentioned some brands on on the call today that are global brands but not everyone's in that situation so when it comes to that economic downturn, yeah, you've got to be speaking with your marketing teams and your organization to say, well, how are we going to get our contingent value proposition out there? How are we going to get our brand out there? Because that's what you are doing with direct sources is attracting them to your brand. And if your brand is not well known or it's known for the wrong reasons, that's going to be a real headwind and a barrier to the success of your program. So that's, again, something that you ought to be attacking uh, in an economic downturn. And I just want to turn, touch back on, on um, the slide we had with all the examples of what companies are doing to manage. And, and in terms of um, driving cost savings as being the most important thing for the participants in, in this webinar, um, one, one example which is very, very specific of how to drive cost savings with direct sourcing is that with these platforms, what you do is you classify all engagements. And what that means is that you will start you will have in-tool questionnaires and, and processes to determine if it's a um, inside I-35 or outside, if it's a W-2 or 1099, et cetera. And what that generally allows companies to do is to start working with more um, contractors that are um, uh, independent contractors and paid gross, and thus that incurs a massive cost savings. And we've seen examples of driving cost savings um upwards of 20 percent without compromising the volume or the quality of talent simply by classifying them correctly making sure that that's good done compliantly uh, and being very flexible in terms of who you can hire obviously um with uh, trying to not increase the risk in, in in working with these people so so there's some very very strong examples of that uh, before we go into the poll results and and and, and the q a um, this is a fun little checklist that uh, that's that's become really popular uh, in terms of assessing, I guess, the um, is your program right for the future and, and the more fast moving um, competitive landscape that we, we're moving into. Um, and, and it's essentially about asking with our current program, can people in my company build their own talent pools? So if you have an IT director in, in London, can they build up their talent pool? And that business unit of the um, most loved uh, contingent workers that they have worked with for the past 10 years so that they are readily available. They can tap into them, they can hire them, they can access previous uh, history and success stories and, and ratings and reviews from their colleagues who've worked with them in the past. So that is one thing. The next one is, can they access a company-wide global talent pool? So not only can they work with their own kind of favorite um, contractors in London, but can they also see if um, 
the um, guys in Italy has some stellar talent that they haven't um, tapped into before or in Japan or in the US. Um, so that you can start redeploying that pre-vetted talent very, very quickly and efficiently throughout the company. The third point is, can um, your company generally add new sourcing, channel, sourcing channels easily? This means that, um, you know, talent sits everywhere. Some of it is in new freelance marketplaces, boutique recruiters, um, organized in small um, small firms of three people that that jump together to build something innovative and so on. And generally, if you have a, an innovative, forward-looking agile program, you should be able to engage those people kind of no matter where they come from. Um, and that means that the technology that you use to manage um, sourcing, onboarding, compliance, and payments should be able to allow you to tap into lots of these different channels and marketplaces, et cetera. Um, and the fourth one, is can you generally rely on the process um, built into the technology to do the heavy lifting? Which means, can you let people onto the platform, whether it's the MSP or the hiring manager directly, um, and, and make, make it so that they cannot do wrong? Because the technology understands that this person is to be contracted on this contract and paid in this way and taxed in this way, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a quick uh, four-step checklist that you can use to, to kind of look at how innovative and, and right for the future is our program, really. All right, should we look at the poll results and yeah. jump into some, uh, some questions? Yeah, let's uh, take a look at these poll results. You're sharing them there. Yeah. So Peter, I'll just give the slides back to you here. Yeah, I'm just going to put my polls into a new window here so I can... Uh, throw this up so it looks like um 51 percent, as you said you saw this early doors i hadn't seen this yet uh drive cost savings uh, that's significant uh faster more robust processes so driving efficiencies being able to do things uh faster uh better access to quality talent we'll come on to that in a moment there that they're the three top ones uh increase the contingent workforce well that's not uh, looking like it's a goer in 2023 only 12 percent of you are saying that you're going to be increasing uh, your contingent workforce interesting any thoughts from you shannon um i can't actually see the poll results but just based on what you shared peter all oh, um, right okay. i'm not surprised driving cost savings is uh, number one right now um, and again, I'm not surprised that increasing the contingent workforce is probably one of the more unpopular choices. Um, so yeah. to be honest, probably that's quite consistent with what I'm seeing. Can you see them, Matthias? Uh, actually, I can't see uh, the actual uh, numbers behind it, but I think I've, I've got someone. I read them out then. Okay, yeah. So uh, they're, they're, they're the three top ones. Uh, more visibility and cost of workers. 30% of people are going to be uh, focusing on that. Um, Implement a direct sourcing strategy, uh, 23%. So that, that surprises me somewhat, uh, whether there's lots of companies out here that are already have one in place, but I, I would have expected that to have been slightly higher. I, I think th th my observation here is the fact that, you know, the, the future is not a fixed destination. Every organization out there is going to have a different destination. And, you know, the future, we, you know, maybe it's about planning for that, you know, disastrous 2023, uh, that flat line 2023. But you never know. <laughs> it, it might all be rosy. So, you, you know, you've got to be careful and prepare for that as well. And of course, not only is it, you know, different destinations, potentially, everyone's starting point is different as well. Yeah, and I guess in terms of driving cost savings, it also depends on how you want to do it. You can hire less people. There you go. <laughs> but uh, that's typically not what, what you're uh, measured on as well when you drive these cost savings. It's, 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 it's cost per hire, I would suppose. And to that, direct sourcing is definitely a lever, um, but there are many. And we also see that the faster, more robust processes is one of these. And what that means is essentially also kind of taking the workflow between identifying who you want to hire or even sourcing um, and until that person has done the work and is offboarded, how many steps, how many people are involved in, in that whole flow uh, and how can you optimize that to save money as well? Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Riley, can I can I just check? Are the um, participants able to view these polling results? The audience. Yes. Uh, if you pull open the polling tab, if you closed it, uh, you can re-expand it or open it up in That's under the great. panel options in the lower right, and you should see those results. Yeah. And if anybody's got any comments or observations on those uh, results, do put them in the uh, the Q and A. Anything to close, uh, Matthias? No. Uh, thanks for uh, for joining. I think. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, there's a qu question here. Um, you talk a lot about uh, new technologies. In a downturn, how do companies speed up the internal adoption of these new technologies? How can they drive that? Um, if you ask me, it's really about building the business case and understanding the wider context of, of you know, technology for technology's sake is, is, is rubbish, right? So you need the, the main, the motivation behind it. You need the driver, you need to build the business case, and you need to align that with the company's overall objectives. Um, and um, and that that is, you know, more and more possible, I would say, because um, it is possible to, you know, build models around, we have big models around, um, your continued workforce spend and so on. So you're welcome to reach out and 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 get one of these and play around with. But basically, build the business case. Um, uh, make sure you you translate that into numbers and escalate those numbers to senior decision makers, so that you can come and say uh, not you know vague arguments about the, the future of the workforce is flexible and we should and so on. But you can come and put numbers on it and say if we do these things. We estimate that we can save this amount of money while getting even faster access to the right talent we need, and that would put us in a better place competitive um, um, wise when the economy picks up or uh, allow us to have a more lean and efficient operation right now. So that's my take on it. What do you say, Kenan? The, the only thing I would add is integration. I think that's fundamental. I think in organizations we have so many tools at times. Integration is vitally important. And the second thing is I completely agree agree with you, Matthias, on, on a business case, but also make sure it's a winning business case because you can bet that there's everyone else is also putting forward their own business case. So make sure yours stands out and it really reads to what your business environment is at the time. All right. Okay. I'm going to draw it to a close there. There are a number of questions there that we haven't had a chance to, to get to. We will respond to you, I promise. Um, thank you very much, Matthias, and, and Worksome for your not only your sponsorship but your you know significant insight into strategies and things to address during a potential economic downturn. Uh, Shannon, thank you so much uh, for your wisdom and your insight as well. Very much appreciated, I'm sure, by anybody, everybody. Uh, there's a number of member resources here. I will add to this because we've actually used a few more than what's listed on this slide. So when you download the slide from the uh, website, uh, this will be expanded. Hopefully we'll see you in May at our CWS Summit at the Royal Lancaster Hotel the 9th and 10th, Tuesday and the Wednesday. Don't forget the Monday is the bank holiday following the uh, King's coronation. And for any council members out there, of course, we've got a, a council meeting on Thursday, the 11th of May. And then we'll be in Dallas for our CWS Summit North America in September. So uh, see you at one of those events, hopefully, uh, wherever you are today or wherever you are listening to this and watching this webinar as a recording. Uh, stay safe. I hope you're well and uh, do reach out to any of us on the panel uh, if you have any further questions. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you.